Okay, last week we learned about consequentialism. This was the last of the four theories. So if you remember, the first two weeks we looked at um, ideas and conceptions that were fundamental to um, thinking about ethics. So we looked at things like free will and contractualism and things like that. Um, and then after two weeks of that, we started looking at four different ethical theories. Um, and the last one we looked at was consequentialism. Uh, and in particular, we looked at a particular type of consequentialism. Um, I'm sure you can tell me which one it was. Particular utilitarianism. utilitarianism. Yes, there's a bit of a clue on the board here. Uh, OK, so we learned about consequentialism. So, OK, what, what's the hallmark of a consequentialist ethical theory? No, 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 no. It's the, the outcome, isn't it? Yeah. It's the outcomes or the... Pain, the, the results. The, the consequences. consequences, that's right. It's the consequences of an action in terms of which we evaluate it morally. Um, and there are different sorts of consequentialism. We looked at utilitarianism, but can anyone name another sort of uh, consequentialism? Well, you said libertarianism, but I'm yes. not sure what that is. Okay, so libertarianism looks at the consequences of an action in terms of freedom instead of in terms of happiness. Um, that's libertarianism. So, for example, Rawls um, is arguably a li libertarian because his first principle of justice is that each should have um, as much liberty as possible consistent with equal liberty for all. So you're looking at actions in terms of the outcome for, for liberty rather than for happiness. But we've been looking at um, utilitarianism and that looks at the consequences of actions of, in terms of what? Happiness. happiness, but it's not just happiness, is it? It's the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Absolutely. It's not my happiness. Um, I, I mean, if it were, I'd be looking at actions according to whether the consequences were good for me or not. Um, that's not a very ethical theory, is it? But utilitarianism is looking at the consequences of actions for the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Good, okay. Um, we asked whether there are any counterexamples to utilitarianism. And in order to quickly look at this, if you've got a claim that says um, acts are right, if and only if, this I double F is if and only if, um, acts, the same acts, produce the greatest happiness of the greatest number. A counterexample will be an act that's right, but that doesn't produce the greatest happiness, the greatest number, or an act that's not right, and that does produce the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Do you see what I mean by a counterexample? And we looked at a particular one. Can anyone remember what it was? Hiroshima. No, we didn't look at Hiroshima. Um, we looked at a, at a particular situation as a p potential counterexample to utilitarianism. The it's the sheriff, exactly so. Can you tell me which of those that is? Is that an act that's right, but that pro doesn't produce the greatest happiness of the greatest number? Or an act that's not right, but that it's the last one? That's right. So the idea is that if the sheriff hangs the innocent tramp, that's an action that intuitively we want to say is not right, so it's not right, we're negating that one, but that does produce the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Now, if, if that action really is of that kind, then it's a counterexample to utilitarianism. And any action you can find that's either right and doesn't produce the greatest happiness of the greatest number, or wrong and does produce the greatest happiness of the greatest number, is going to be a counterexample to the utilitarian claim. Do you see why? Good. OK. Um, we also looked at the many different interpretations of utilitarianism. So um, if, I, if you remember, I told you it was multiply ambiguous. Can anyone tell me anything about any of these ambiguities of the, of the greatest happiness principle, the claim that the right action is the action that produces the greatest happiness of the greatest number? Why is that ambiguous? 
Because it, it might mean happiness now or average happiness over the period of time. It might mean total happiness or average happiness, that's right. And there's a big difference between if I can create the average happiness of the people in this room, or if, I, if I'm not concerned about the average, but I'm looking only at totals, and um, John here is someone I can make very happy in very easily, um, and the rest of you are miserable sods, and it's going to take me ages to make you happy, then maybe I'll concentrate on him. Okay, what other ambiguities are there? You might not be able to tell what is the greatest happiness. In, in both cases, or either case. Okay, that's, not, that's really an epistemological problem rather than a problem of interpretation, isn't it? Um, but we might say, what is happiness? Um, and different accounts of what happiness is will generate different sorts of utilitarianism, won't they? So if happiness is to have your desires satisfied, that's one form of utilitarianism. If happiness is um, Aristotelian eudaimonia, that's a different sort of utilitarianism. Any other ambiguities there? What about in the greatest number? We looked at whether Hitler might have been a good utilitarian. It's just that he didn't count Jews. So if we want to say, well, the greatest number, the greatest number of what? Humans? Animals, including human animals? Sentient beings, etc., etc. It starts sure, to become quite difficult. When he was Mill meant humans, yes. but Bentham thought it was um, no, all no, animals. To him, any sort of changes in, in the meaning of, of, of who it is they're talking about. Okay, and then we reflected on whether there are different qualities of happiness. Do you remember Mill thinks there are different qualities, mm -hmm. and that in um, making the utilitarian calculus, we've got to count the different qualities of happiness as well as the different quantities, whereas Bentham thought it was just quantities, not qualities. Okay, and what did we look at when we looked at there? We looked at a particular charge against Mill, which was the, that he might be an elitist, yes. When he's, what's he mean by quality of happiness? Is he suggesting that superior forms of happiness are, are things like going to philosophy lectures and inferior forms of happiness are going to things like bingo? If, if he does mean that, then it looks as if it's very difficult for him to avoid the charge of elitism. Well, is and I, and I elitism? Well, that's a different question that we'll put on one side for a minute. And I suggested that uh, another way to understand it might be to think of the difference between a superior form of happiness being the sort of happiness that a rational animal can achieve by forming a goal for themselves, setting out a strategy by which to achieve that goal, and then achieving it. And that, as we all know, brings a happiness that, you know, can we compare it to the happiness we get from eating a good meal or drinking a good glass of wine? Maybe that's what he meant by superior forms of happiness, with the inferior being the sort of things that just come from satisfying bodily needs uh, or desires. Actually, I found that a bit difficult the more I thought about it, because I thought, would well, I prefer a good meal, you know, with a bit of wine, rather than, you know, um, I don't know, reading a book by um, Hume or something. Uh, and, and actually, I had to say, I'm, I'm fully sorry, but I had to say I prefer the meal. <laughs> <laughs> right, OK, fair enough. Uh, and it's certainly the case that... that um, all of us are going to sometimes prefer the good meal, aren't we? We can't always be um, doing philosophy lectures, making, uh, either listening to them or giving them, indeed. So, um, yes, the, there's... Mill claims that there are different qualities of happiness and these need to be brought into account, but you might prefer to go with Bentham, thinking that, actually, even if there are different qualities of happiness, the qualities don't count, it's only the quantities... Um, so poetry might be better than pushpin, but that's only because poetry is likely to make many more people happy or make, make for much more happiness than a single game of pushpin. OK, then finally we reflected on the distinction between act and rule utilitarian, where act utilitarian is... is, um, is token. Sorry? Uh, act is, is the token action, isn't it? That's right, yes. So you're looking at the token act in order to see whether it produces the greatest happiness or the greatest number, as opposed to looking at the, um, whether a type of action produces the greatest happiness or the greatest number. And if you look at that, it generates a rule, and then you look at the token action against the rule.
that would be rule utilitarianism. So act utilitarianism is a one-step procedure where you check every action against the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Rule utilitarian is a two-step procedure where you check type of act types of action against the greatest happiness, but then you look at the token action in accordance to, with, the, with that rule. And what is, well, we looked at the distinction between act and rule utilitarianism. Why would anyone think that rule utilitarianism is preferable to act utilitarianism? Why would anyone think rule utilitarianism is preferable to act utilitarianism? Because it gives you a basis to decide without having to calculate the final consequences. Um, you might think it's easier because we only have to look at an act and think, is it a lie? Um, and if it's a lie, then we shouldn't do it, presuming that one of our rules is, yes, that, that's true, it could be easier. Um, another reason is that it, it's intuitively uh, acceptable to us in a way, because it fits in with the idea that there are moral rules. Um, we all think that, roughly speaking, we shouldn't lie, shouldn't kill, should keep promises, etc. And rule utilitarianism generates those very rules. Um, so it's quite intuitively acceptable to us. OK, so that, that's what we did last week. Um, and we've now finished our romp through the different moral theories that we're going to look at, all four of them. Um, and this week, we're going to compare and contrast them. And you're going to decide which you like best. We're going to do a poll at the end. Not, not that the poll necessarily has any... Um, basis in which is the right theory, of course. It might be just which one do you like best or which one have I taught best or all sorts of things. But we'll have a look at which one comes out top in this class. OK, so let's have a quick run through all of them just to refresh our memory about what they all are. So Aristotle, um, and we're looking at his virtue theory, or rather the theory he initiated, because modern day virtue theories are often not terribly Aristotelian, but he got them all started. And basically, Aristotle argues that the right action is that which is performed by a virtuous person. And do you remember when I said that to you, you all went, huh? <laughs> you know, that, that's not very helpful. Um, OK, but we have to know what a virtuous person is. And for Aristotle, a virtuous person is a person who knows what is right, does what is right, and then does what is right for the right reason. Do you remember that? So we looked at the moral dilemma that I brought up in the first week, the one that says, what happens when your mum comes home and says, you know, oh, yeah. do you like my hair? And you think, yuck. Uh, and you can't be both kind and honest, so you've got a bit of a problem here. And... Um, so the rules that you've been given as children are not going to help you here. You've got to engage in what Aristotle calls right reason. Um, and what Aristotle says is that if you're a virtuous person, you know what you should do in this situation. Now, notice that you're in a particular situation now with all the particularities of that situation. So, for example, if I say your mum's been depressed for six months and this is the first time you've seen her smile... OK, does that push you towards being kind rather than being honest? Or another thing, if, if your mum has a, a bit of a habit of coming back with the most terrible hairstyles and then three weeks later thinks, you know, oh, my God, you know, how could you have let me go out like that? Which, which does that push you towards? OK, so do you see, the more you know about the context, the easier it is, perhaps, to make the moral decision. But... The, the fact is, if, you've been, if you're a person who has encouraged yourself in the habits of virtue, to be courageous, to be honest, to be kind, all those things, then you will know in that situation what it is to do the right thing. If you don't know, what should you do? Ask someone you do believe to be a virtuous person. That's right. You, you ask for advice from someone you, th you think of as virtuous. OK, but let's say you know in that situation. You've, you've then got to do it. And we all know that actually knowing what the right thing is to do or believing what the right thing is to do does not mean necessarily that you're going to do it. We can all be weak. We can all be... Um, well, we can, can't we? So, but you, if you're a virtuous person, you're not going to be weak. You're going to not only know what the right action is, you're going to perform it. And finally, 
you're going to perform it for the right reason. And this draws an interesting distinction between what the right action is and the moral so the morality of the action itself and the morality of the agent performing the action. Because you can perform an action that is the one required by morality, but without actually being moral yourself in doing it. So let's say that the right action in this situation is being honest. OK, so um, you know that being honest is the right thing to do. And you, you, what's more, you are honest, but you're honest because you're feeling a bit spiteful. Do you see? Yes. At the moment you tell your mum her hair looks horrible, you're not doing it because you want to save her from looking horrible, da 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 da. You're doing it because you, you feel a bit mean at that moment. We've all had that sort of feeling, haven't we? And the other possibility is, is that you can be kind, not because you think that being kind is the right thing to do, but because you lack moral courage. Oh, yes, you, yes. you believe that you should tell the truth, but you quail at the last minute. OK, so in each of those cases, you might be doing the right thing, but you're not doing it for the right reason. And Aristotle would say you're not, for that very reason, being a virtuous person at that moment and probably not a virtuous person full stop because you haven't got yourself into the right habits. OK, so that's Aristotle. Um, now, do, would anyone like to ask questions about Aristotle before we go on to Hume or, or shall I go through them all and then we'll... Go through them all. Put your hands up if you think I should go through them all. OK, you're just making me work. That's what it is. <laughs> OK, that's Aristotle. This is Hume. Hume argued that the right action is that for which a true judge, OK, one who adopts a stable and general perspective on the world, is going to feel approbation. So do you remember? He, he feels a positive, a pro-attitude towards an action that's right, because he adopts a stable and general perspective on the world. And do you remember why Hume said that? Can anyone remind me why Hume took this particular view? He made a very important distinction which rather undermined Aristotle's point of view. Is this about passion? That's right, it's about passion and reason. That's right. What Hume believed is that um, Aristotle rather assumes that, that what motivates a moral action is reason. And what Hume comes in and says, well, no, if you look at what reason is and what passion is, you'll see that reason can never motivate an action. It can never motivate nor suppress an action, because, of course, the suppression of an action is itself an action. Um, all action has got to be passion-driven driven by our desires or pro-attitudes. And, and there's got to be something in that, because if we think, OK, let, let's say that I can work out now that the best way to get a cup of coffee is to go to the common room, uh, or perhaps given the fact it's the wrong time, I'd actually have to go to the shop down the road and buy a cup of coffee. Um, but I can reason about that as much as I like, and I won't actually do anything unless I want a cup of coffee. Um, and what's more, want a cup of coffee more than I want to... Um, yes. finish this yes. lecture. So it's our passions that move us, according to Hume, not our reasons. So somehow we've got to generate an account of morality that's based in, in our passions, in what we want. And there's a problem with that, surely, because we think of morality as altruistic. We think of it as other regarding. But if every action you perform has to be performed in order to satisfy a desire of yours then how can there be any moral actions? It looks a bit difficult to, to say that all action, including moral action, is passion-driven, because maybe you end up saying that there aren't any moral actions at all. So Hume was required to come up with his own account of what moral action is, um, based on the idea that it, all actions are driven by passions. And what he came up with is the idea that um, Passions may drive actions, but reasons guide our actions to the end. Um, and what reason can do is tell us um, what the perspectives of everybody will be on this action. And they can also... So if you're thinking about an issue like, for example, um, should there be a no-fly zone over Libya or something like that, or, or um, should we build nuclear power stations uh, in order to... Um, secure our energy supply. 
um, you might initially have a very strong um, attitude of disapprobation against one of these things. You know, you, no, of course we shouldn't have a no-fly zone over Libya. Of course we shouldn't build, build power stations. Um, but you've got to stand back from that initial sense of disapprobation and ask, well, OK, I've got, I want to adopt a general perspective on this, a stable perspective. And you look at the, the thing from different angles until you reach a point where you feel you have looked at them from all perspectives, if you see what I mean, and you have stabilised in your view, instead of going on one hand this and on one hand that and on da-da-da-da. Um, so we might come out to something a bit more Aristotelian when we do take into account how reason is also involved in the production of action, albeit not as a motivator of action, but as a guider of action. OK? So that, that's Hume. Then we went on to Kant. And if you remember, Kant completely disagrees with Hume on moral action only. So Kant allows that Hume is right for every other sort of action except moral action. You have to have a passion to motivate your action unless the belief that you're entertaining at the moment, the reason that you're entertaining at the moment, is one either this action is right or this action is wrong. And those two concepts, right and wrong, according to Kant, are intrinsically action-guiding. To, to recognise that an action is right is, entails the belief that you should do it. All by itself. You don't need a passion. You don't need a desire to perform the right action. Because if you really understood what the right action is, you, you couldn't possibly have a desire to perform it because you wouldn't have a desire not to perform it. The idea that you might desire to not do the right thing is, shows you haven't understood right according to Kant. So there are two beliefs, doing A is right and doing A is wrong, that will themselves entail a, an imperative. And because they're these imperatives are entailed without the need for an inclination or passion, they are categorical imperatives. They're not conditional upon your having any particular desire. Um, instead, they come purely from reason. And that's why, says Kant, the, um, the right action is the action that's performed out of reverence for the law. And if you remember, we looked at a particular um, example of this, Fred and Joan coming from different ends of Brazenose Lane, and there's the beggar sitting in the middle, and Fred, now I've forgotten which way is which, so don't pick me up on this, but they both give him a pound, but Fred gives him a pound because he wants to impress Joan, and Joan gives him a pound because he believes it's, she believes it's the right thing to do. Which one has acted rightly? Well, if you think it's Joan who's acted rightly because she did it because it was the right thing to do, then you're with Kant on this. So if you think that Fred, in giving the pounds because he wanted to impress Joan, was not performing a moral action, but a self-seeking action, he, he was looking to satisfy a desire of his own, then, then you're siding with Kant on that particular issue, at least. Because Joan, but not Fred, was acting on a moral imperative. Got that the wrong way around, haven't I? Yeah. Fred, but not Joan, was acting on a categorical imperative. So that's, that's Kant. Then finally, we looked at Mill, who argues that the right action is that which produces the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Now, notice that, that this, again, um, has a sort of universalising feel to it. Well, actually, it isn't a sort of universalising feel. It is a universalising feel. The idea is that when you look at an action and ask whether you should do it or not, you should consider the consequences of that action in terms of the happiness of everyone that action might affect. OK, it's not just you and yours. It's in terms of everybody. So just as Kant wants you to ask yourself whether the action would be universal law or you could will the action to be universal law, what if everyone were to do this? Um, Mill's asking you to consider the impact of this action on everyone. So they're alike in that both of them ask you to universalise your the maxims with which you act, the intentions with which you act. Um, and, well, we've already looked at utilitarianism earlier on today. So, so um, 
what I'm going to ask you to do now is to compare and contrast and either tell me things or ask me things. Um, so I'm in your hands from now on. Let's have a few questions. Moral facts. Moral facts. It's always a good start. Well, I think for me, this all, when you look at things like true judges and virtuous people and all that, I sort of think, well, you know, fine, that's useful, but really, do these people really know the moral facts? If you could say, you know, grew them and say, well, yes, I've got moral facts, it's A, B, and C, and they can prove they're true judges uh, or a virtuous person or whatever. So uh, I think um, you mentioned that most philosophers think there are moral facts, but I haven't actually stumbled across any. Right, OK. So let's ask, what is a moral fact? And for me, you know, a moral, it could be a fact to the extent that we think, you know, the moon is a fact, which, we, you know, it might be an illusion. Well, the moon isn't a fact, is it? The moon is an object. No, but the fact that the moon oh, is the there. Fact the, moon is, is a fact. the fact yeah. the moon is, exists may be a fact, that, but, I but... I mean, it may not be there, maybe an illusion or whatever, but it's, you know, that's good enough for me. Right, but it, it is rather important that it's not the moon that's a, fa no, a fact. No, you, you see yeah, that. Yeah, okay. You okay. Is this to do with this? But by moral fact, do you mean something that... Well, hang on, that, I, I haven't even answered that question yet, so let me... Can I try and answer it, and then, then you can come back to me? OK, so what John's asking is, what is a moral oh, fact? Sorry, I missed his name. Mike. I'm, I'm John. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm always confused. You see, you say, you've even split up, so you're not sitting next to each other, so I won't confuse you, but I'm, I'm still getting your names wrong. OK, um... If we think of a fact as um, a state of affairs that makes true or false, I mean, that's uh, a moral belief, um, does that help you at all? No, no, it helps me, but I guess the problem is that um, I haven't come across any examples well, here's an example. OK, um, a utilitarian would think that uh, what makes the statement dropping the bomb on Hiroshima is the right thing to do true was that dropping the bomb on Hiroshima led to the greatest happiness of the greatest number. You can put false in there if you prefer. Do you see what I mean? So the fact that makes true the belief dropping the bomb on Hiroshima was right is the fact that dropping the bomb on Hiroshima produced the greatest happiness, the greatest number, if it did. I understand that, but I suppose there's a Well, stumbling. there's a moral fact. No, but there's a stumbling block for me in that you can't prove that oh. it's true, and therefore, how do you know it's a fact? Yeah. But that's an epistemological question, and you, you were asking me a metaphysical question. Wow. I, I, no, there's a, no, there's a... I mean, you thought that. <laughs> Did he ask me a metaphysical question or an epistemological question? You say true or false, depending really on your viewpoint. So I did not say... Oh, no, I see what you mean. Ah, oh, that's so unfair. That's so unfair. I just said, if you don't prefer... If, if you don't think dropping on the bomb of the Hiroshima is the right thing to do, you can put false in where I put true. Um, but the, the, the fact is... Um, no, let's distinguish whether the fact exists and whether we can know it exists. Those are two different well, things. No, and no. you asked me what a moral fact okay, was, so, so I could not that, how do we know whether moral yeah, facts so exist. There is a fact about that. Okay, so, so actually you're not worried about... So I'm not... No, 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 my question really was... How do we know? How do we ever... No. Yeah. Ever know. So I agree. I, I can that. agree that may or may not be moral facts, and, and in fact, that's a good <laughs> example. But you could say yes, that there is a moral fact. But I suppose I don't find it useful if you can't prove one way or the other. And tell me, what do you mean by prove here? <laughs> well, I, I suppose because I'm an engineer. Yes, I, I, yeah. that's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. Um, to the extent that, that, that if you have a model which you can show works, you know, to a certain but point. But I think you're, um, it, it, we can know now that um, 
morality isn't an empirical science. Okay, an empirical science is one in which any claim that you make should be, at least in principle, such that we can show that it's either true or false. And we can show it, we can either observe it in the world uh, or we can um, conduct some sort of experiment to show that it's true. But some philosophers say that we learn by experience, don't we? Others say we learn by rules. Well, um, utilitarianism believes, uh, claims to be an inductive uh, morality in the sense that how do we know that um, lying is wrong is true? Well, we observe that yeah. lying often doesn't lead to the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Yeah. But of course, that doesn't mean that when, when we're wondering what to do in the next case, we can observe that this lie won't produce the greatest happiness. I mean, observation just doesn't seem to hack it when we're talking about morality, and neither does experiment. I mean, it's very interesting that people are getting quite excited about all these opinion polls mm -hmm. about morality. You know, so, so um, you can go to, onto quite a few websites at the moment and uh, take part in a poll which says, what are your intuitions on the trolley problem, for example? Have any of you done this? Oh, the, there's a very good website called Philosophy Bites, um, and um, I think it's called Philosophy Bites, but, and, and you can go on to it and there's the discussion of the trolley where you're on a trolley, oh no, you're not, a, hang on, let's get this right. You're on a trolley, the trolley is going to kill five people on this line, or you can pull a switch and it'll go off onto the, the other line and it'll kill only one person. Okay, now if you stay on the trolley and don't pull the lever, you won't have killed the five, will you? Um, but the, the trolley would have done. If you go off, you'll, you'll have killed the one because you'll have pulled the, what should you do? And then there are variations on the theme. Um, so you might think, well, uh, it, there's a bridge over the line and there's a fat person sitting on the bridge and you're next to the fat person. And if you push the fat person off and he lands uh, in front of the trolley, it'll stop the trolley and save the five, but kill the one. So lots of people think that they would pull the lever and kill the one on the branch line, but they wouldn't push the fat man off. Do you see, and you've got a bit of a problem here because in each case you're killing one to save five. Why is it okay in one case and not okay in another? But what's interesting is this, this sort of pseudo inductivism which, which um, asks so many people what their intuitions are. And I'm wondering what, what's intended to come from that. Does that show us that the action's right or wrong? No, I don't think so. All it does is, is play with our intuitions, which is very useful and very interesting. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it shows us anything about morality. Um, and if, if you think, if, you, if particularism is right, um, I, I mean, I think this is a very interesting point. If particularism is right, the idea is that what makes an action right is something about the very situation in which that action is going to be performed. Now, that means that if you ever get another situation exactly the same, then you're going to... So if you think the first was right, you're going to think the second was right. Do you see what I mean? So, so if you like, moral facts supervene on other facts, descriptive facts. If you get the facts absolutely right, the morality, sorry, exactly the same, the morality will also stay the same. Um, so we could say that actually morality has rules over possible worlds rather than over the actual world. So in this world, you might say doing that action is right, okay, um, but you're saying over every, what that means is that over every possible world, in every world in which that action is performed, it will be right. Do you see what I mean? So the only rule is a rule over possible worlds rather than the actual world, because each rule will be instantiated only once in this world. Does wanting a moral fact make you a moral absolutist? No. Because it might be that, I mean, the fact that makes it true that sardines are tasty for me um, is that it's my personal preference. I, I like sardines. That's the fact that makes it true for me that sardines are tasty. But sardines are tasty is true only re relative to individuals, isn't it? That's not a moral fact, is it? Uh, no, but... It, but <laughs> 
No, but if you're an individual relativist and you believe that moral statements are true only relative to individuals, you still think that there are moral facts that make true these statements. It's just they're facts about personal preferences. Now, you missed that by asking me the question in the middle, so I'm going to repeat that because I, I think I might have misled you there, or rather you misled. <laughs> um, so, if you have the statement, sardines are tasty, okay, is that true or false? I think it's true. For me, it's true. The truth of sardines are tasty is relative to each individual. Do you like sardines? Yeah. Uh, that's unfortunate. Who doesn't like sardines? No, oh, well, you don't like sardines. OK, remind me of your name. Sybil. Sybil. OK, so sardines are tasty is true for me, but false for Sybil. There's a fact that makes it true that sardines are not tasty for Sybil. And there's a fact that makes it true for me that sardines are tasty. And the fact is to do with Sybil in the first case and to do with me in the second case. So if moral statements like mugging elderly ladies is OK is true only relative to individuals, it's still made true by facts, but the facts are facts about individuals. Yes? So you, um, the absolutism, relativism, uh, and the question of moral facts are completely separate questions. Yes? Uh, just carrying this argument on a little bit, I, I've come to the conclusion, rightly or wrongly, I'm sure you'll argue with me, that morality so. is cultural. Um, because when you take the fact that killing is wrong, this is something you said last week, you, you seem to suggest that we have an innate aversion to killing. And, and I forget the, the exact examples you gave, but everyone seemed to agree we have an innate aversion to killing. Um, and seem to be wrong. I don't, I don't, but the Greeks yeah. left disabled children on mountainside and their old people. The Red Indians abandoned their old as they got weak and uh, decrepit. They left them to the babies of nature. They didn't agonise about it or think this is wrong. This is a, you know, a moral fact. It's wrong to do that, wrong to, to abandon each other in our hour of need. They, because that was their culture. Um, okay. they, they didn't you know, suffer guilt or... So, so what you're saying is that different cultures have different moral beliefs. Uh, it seems to me and therefore, that. morality is relative to culture. OK, can anyone say where there's a, a link missing in that argument? Can anyone tell me what the missing link is in that argument? There are two, two ways you might respond to that, actually. Come on! <laughs> we did this in week two. The, you, should, yeah, you should know this very well. <laughs> no? OK. C can we go just straight from A and B believe different things to therefore A and B both have true beliefs? No, why not? They just have beliefs. So yes, not, not all, all we're doing is describing the fact that... OK, so, so um, where's my black pen? I need two black pens. Just, uh... It doesn't make a true story false. Well, let, let's just um, have a look at it. So, um, culture one and culture two. Culture one believes P... And culture one believes not P. So P might be killing is wrong for us, and this is us, OK? And this is uh, killing is OK, uh, and these are the ancient Greeks, OK? So you're saying that that is evidence for moral relativism, yeah? OK, well, I'm saying you can't go just from that to moral relativism because... One possibility is that one or other of us has it wrong. I mean, it could be that but, uh, the Greeks were wrong to think that killing is acceptable. In other words, they believed it, but the belief they had was false. We, or we could be wrong. I mean, maybe we're wrong not to, to kill disabled children. I mean, there was a very interesting discussion, actually, in the paper last week about premature babies, wasn't there? Mm -hmm. 
you know, maybe we are wrong to think that we should keep alive premature babies and, and very elderly people, etc. Yes. Um, so the fact that pe different people have different beliefs. Do you remember the logical blunder I talked about? Let's do it again because it's worth looking at again. Um, Chris. Yeah. Is, no, no, I know what your problem can, can I just do this and then we can come back to it? Okay. Is it Chris? Mike. Oh, God. <laughs> I do apologise. <laughs> no, 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 don't change it now. <laughs> okay, Mike believes Marianne is wearing red. Right? Okay. Uh, there's an embedding belief and an embedded belief. Remember? Um, could they both be true? Yeah. yeah, I mean, probably they both are true. It's both true that you believe I'm wearing red and it's true that I'm wearing red. Okay, could they both be false? Yes. Yeah. yeah, so you might have formed no belief at all about mm -hmm. my skirt. Maybe you didn't come today. Uh, and maybe I'm not wearing red. Okay, so they could both be false. Or that one could be true and that one could be false, couldn't it? Maybe he's colourblind or, or having a little funny turn or something like that. Or it could be the other way around. That could be false and that could be true. And the point about this is, is that the um, truth value of a belief that somebody has... Uh, sorry, of the, the truth of someone's believing something and the truth of the belief they have are quite separate. What makes this belief true is something about Mike. What makes that belief true is something about me. And if we put that into the moral field, Fred believes mugging elderly ladies is okay, you find that the truth values of those two can vary completely separately again. So it might be true that Fred believes that mugging elderly ladies is okay, but it's not true that mugging elderly ladies is okay. You know, Fred has a false belief. So in exactly the same way, um, I'm looking for culture one. It might be true that culture two believes that it's not the fact that killing is wrong, and yet they're wrong. Or it might be the fact that culture one believes that killing is okay, and yet they're wrong. So it's the mere fact that people have different beliefs doesn't show that moral relativism, cultural relativism, is true. Another way to respond to that is this one. I'll just say this quickly, and then you can come back to me. Um, uh, when you get two plants that look very different, this doesn't mean that they're not genetically identical. Um, if you get two genetically identical seeds and put one in John Innes number three seed compost and the other in ghastly garden earth that the builders have been throwing rubble into for three weeks. I'm having my roof done at the moment, so this is on the top of my head. Um, and you put that one in the airing cupboard and water it just very occasionally enough to keep it alive, but the other one you keep on the windowsill and nurture and to talk to it and so on. They're going to look very, very different in five weeks' time, aren't they? But it doesn't mean that they aren't genetically identical. Nature and nurture go together into the making of a plant. And in exactly the same way, you might say, um, well, the thing that's in common with the ancient Greeks and ourselves is that we valued human life, um, or we valued human lives that had a certain quality. But whereas we think life is sufficient to have quality of life, they didn't. They, th they think that actually you've got to have a, a good, better quality of life than we think you've got to have in order to be, for life to be worth living. Do you see what I mean? So there may be a common value between us and the ancient Greeks that in our different societies leads to different behaviour. So it's not that absolutism isn't true, um, but it's that that absolute belief in two different contexts leads to two apparently different beliefs, apparently inconsistent beliefs. Or it might be that moral relativ uh, cultural relativism is true. Yep. I mean, that, that's... But I just... I, you absolutely cannot go to cultural relativism just from the recognition 
that, that different cultures believe different things. That's what you can't do. OK? Do you want to come back? To well, good arguments, you know. Um, well, thank well you. Um, but it, it's not decisive. You know, no, I said, or, or you could be a relativist, yeah. But you can't be a relativist on the basis of the argument you gave. A, a moral fact, you know, we're no nearer. Uh, we weren't talking about moral facts, we were talking about moral relativism there. Y you, if you want to be a moral relativist, a cultural relativist, you need a better argument than the one you gave me. Because the one you gave me can be come back on in the two ways that I came back on it. Yes. Okay. Uh, now, I, I'm not saying you can't come back on it, I think you probably can. Um, well, I probably can't. But, <laughs> but at the end of the day, uh, like Chris... Uh, my, my. My. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I've started it now. This is it, it's, it's a moral fact that, that would be very useful, you know, and... They're, they're not Sorry, right. what's a fact that would be very useful? That something is wrong or right, you know, like killing. You know, it would be very nice to have a proof, mm. and I can't... That killing is wrong? That, that, or that it's right. You know, mm. I'm not fussed. <laughs> uh, well, I absolutely, completely disbelieve you when you say you're not fussed. Well, I absolutely do wrong. not believe you. Yeah, but, you, uh, but you're telling me that it might be all right? Uh, uh, yes, I'm sure that it's Killing my... Right. Now, OK, let me, uh, let me press you a bit further here. Um, are you saying that this might be right? Um, ugh. No, 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 not doing that. Depends on the old lady, doesn't it? <laughs> right. Okay. Um, there are two sorts. Here's, here's a claim about a token action. That killing is wrong. Now, that killing is going to be a killing of Fred, um, you know, age 27 on January the 16th, 2011, da-da-da-da. So that's a particular killing, and, and the claim is that that killing is wrong. Or killing is wrong is a claim about, you know, here, here's a, a type of action. These are all killings. And you're saying of all of these actions that they're wrong, whereas here you're picking out one of them and saying of it that it's wrong. Now, um, I've said earlier you're not going to get any proof if you're talking about empirical proof that either of these claims is true. But I think you can get... Um, if you look at a particular... When we say killing is wrong, is that true or false? Well, we can all think of counterexamples to that very, very quickly, can't we? Um, you're yearning for a rule like that, and I think you're not going to get one. Because anything of that kind, there are going to be so many different things in, this, in the class of actions there that the idea that not a single one of them would be right... Or, or at least not wrong, is, is a bit forlorn. Whereas this one, um, you might well have something... Um, you wouldn't call it a proof. It certainly isn't an empirical proof. But every person who looked at that action might think, no, actually, that killing is right. I mean, I'll, I'll try and put, put an example to you, and, and everyone will be able to, to knock, this, knock holes in this, but let, let's say we've got a situation where somebody has been so badly injured in an accident that um, it's not that they've lost all consciousness or anything. On the contrary, they are in pain, and such terrible, terrible pain, and it can't be um, alleviated in any way, and they're begging us to kill them. Would that killing be wrong? OK, so, so lots of people think here, because we have very strong intuitions that in this case, this may be the right thing to do. Uh, and we may have equally strong intuitions in other particular cases that a particular killing is wrong. 
You know, uh, well, we can Im immediately think of lots of those, I should think. If every time we open the paper, we see um, lots of cases of those. So, so when, you, when you're yearning for, for a moral truth, ask yourself exactly what you're yearning for, because if you're yearning for something like that, a rule like that, you're probably not going to get it. If you're yearning for something like that, I'm not sure you don't have it already. And here's another thing you might have. Um, uh, produce the greatest happiness to the greatest number. That's, that's another rule, isn't it? And maybe that's also something you think intuitively is right. Lots of people have done. So in this yearning for different moral rules, you need to um, identify different types of moral rules or moral claims um, and ask yourself whether it's realistic you're going to get a truth here um, or a proof here. It just seems that to depend at the end of the day on intuition makes all the arguments a bit spurious. You know, I mean, we all got intuition. You know, it sounds so flaky. Okay, so tell me, why do you think that 2 plus 2 equals 4 is true? Well, because I've been told. <laughs> ah. <laughs> well, okay, but you, you don't believe every. You don't. You don't believe everything you're told is true, do you? <laughs> it is a question I actually asked as a child. You know, well, I'm you, well, ask, I'm asking you it now. What, what, what would you say is? Is it because every time you've looked at two apples and two apples, there've been four apples? Probably, yeah. but you could call it five. Yeah, it's a concept. Ah, well, okay. That's um, as long as you leave stable the meaning of two, two plus equals and four. We know, don't we, that in every possible world, two plus two is four. That there is no possible world. So actually, we're quite capable of surveying different possible worlds and knowing what happens in those worlds. Now, let me ask you a question. Here's this killing again, the killing of the person who's in terrible pain. Is there a possible world in which that killing would be wrong? If you think it's wrong in this world, you might think it's wrong in every world. But if you think it's right in this world, you might think that it would be right in every other world as well. In other words, it might be that the sort of reasoning that we go in for when we reason morally is a priori reasoning of exactly the kind we go in for when we go in for mathematical reasoning. Do you see what I mean? It's, it's, it's not empirical. It's not a matter of observation and experiment. Instead, it's a matter of consulting our reason and observing the different possible worlds, not observing the actual world, but surveying the different possible worlds in our reason. And we do do that all the time. Let me ask you a question. Do you think if the Germans had won the war, we'd be speaking German? Not necessarily, okay, so you can see, you believe that there are some possible worlds in which the Germans won the war and we would be speaking German, and some possible worlds in which the Germans won the war and we wouldn't be speaking German. And I bet you could describe a little bit about each of those worlds. So we're quite capable, and this is what it is to be rational, this is what it is to, well, I was going to say be human, but if there are other uh, rational animals, they could do the same thing. Uh, we can survey possible worlds as well as, actual, as the actual world. And morality, our ability to understand morality, may be part of that ability to survey possible worlds. When Kant asks, should we make false promises? What he wants us to answer is, well, if we, um, if we try and universalise the maxim on which we'd make a false promise. So, OK, everybody should make false promises in order to gain advantage. Um, when we do that, we look at the possible world in which everyone is making false promises. We see that in that world, there is no institution of promise keeping. And that would be a world that's less advantageous, less good for us than the world in which there is an institution of promise keeping. So Kant says that we therefore see that we shouldn't make false promises. Because if we did so, we'd lose out because everybody would lose out. 
So all, all I'm saying, there, there, are different way, there are different ways of finding out things. There's a priori reasoning, there's uh, empirical reasoning, there's testimony, there's, there's all sorts of things. And what, where we certainly would make a mistake is if we conflate moral reasoning with empirical reasoning. Actually, I say we'd certainly make a mistake, and the utilitarians do claim that uh, theirs is an inductive morality. Let, let's move on. There are other questions. You're going back to week one, um, when, we, when we, we're talking about moral facts, are we arguing between moral generalism and moral particularism? Well, moral generalism uh, holds that there are moral rules. So moral rules are true. And you've got to ask, do they mean that sort of rule or that sort of rule? But the sort of facts that makes that rule true would be a different sort of fact from what makes that rule true. And Dancy, of course, believes that no rule of that kind is true. So, and, and both of the facts that make true those things would be different from the facts that makes that, true that one. Are you saying that producing the greatest happiness, the greatest number, is in fact moral generalism? It's a, for, it's a form of moral generalism. Um, Dancy actually doesn't mention higher order rules at all. Um, but insofar as a, a general claim is a moral rule, then um, I, I assume that's some form of moral generalism, yes. Yeah, I assume so. I, I may be wrong, because as I say, he doesn't mention higher order rules. I think we've got to understand partly what we mean by intuition here. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are these sort of intuitions we have which are gut feelings. So, oh God, that's wrong, that's terrible. Um, that's absolutely not what Kant means when he talks about intuitions. Um, I, the idea, I mean, there are some American ethicists who say that we shouldn't try and be logical when we look at moral thinking. Um, we should go from the gut. Now, that's sort of using a, a Humean idea, but in a way that Hume, I think, wouldn't have liked it at all. Um, they think if you, if you actually apply logic, you might go wrong, because actually in morality, we should be looking at our feelings. Um, and so that they say things like, well, cloning is, is very obviously wrong, because we all sense it's wrong. It's, it's in the gut. And you think, well, hang on, no, um, this isn't right. There's a sense... There's a sense in which we have to go on intuition. And there's a sense in which you're going on intuition right now, because as I'm speaking, you're thinking to yourself, that sounds right, and, or that doesn't sound right. I don't think I go with that. Or do you see what I mean? You're, you're having intuitions about... And actually, intuition is the rock-bottom basic for a, for a rational animal. Um, because what you're thinking is, is it true? Is it false? Should I believe this? Should I not believe this? Etc. And your first thought is what we tend to mean by intuition in, in our language. You know, just intuition tells me it's wrong. But actually, as a philosopher and indeed as a scientist or, um, or anyone who cares about truth, you have an intuition, but you've then got to try and pin that intuition down. Say... So, OK, what does it mean? It sounds wrong. Why does it sound wrong? What is it that's wrong about it? OK, is it wrong? Can I give an argument for it being wrong? Do you see what I mean? And when you've pinned down your intuition and you can actually say what it is that's wrong about something, now you have reasons to be wrong. So there's no reason without intuition. Um, you, you absolutely cannot have reason without intuition. But if you leave it at intuition in our sense, i.e. just a gut feeling without any pressing of that gut feeling, you're almost certainly going to go wrong. Um, because what you're doing is you're, you're going with your feelings of approbation and disapprobation without bothering to, to adopt a stable and general perspective. Does that make sense? So, so intuitions are very important, but they're important as a first step, not as the final word. Do you see what I mean? You, 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 we've got to have intuitions that say, no, there's something wrong with that, there's something right with that. But if we leave it there, 
I think we're, we're neglecting Isn't something. Isn't there a dialogue oh. between the two, between the intuition and the reason? Between <laughs> uh, it is in a way, yes, because, um, I mean, one of, the, one of the things, when I used to teach undergraduates, um, you, could, you would find people whose intuitions were, were in good order, um, but they were lazy, perhaps. So they, ha they had their intuitions, but they left them there. They, they didn't bother to um, cash them out in any way. Um, but actually, what you really want as a philosopher is somebody whose intuitions are good and who is prepared to then work on them. So, so they get this strong sense that there's something wrong with an argument, but they don't leave it there. They say, OK, what can be wrong with an argument? What makes a good argument? It's got to have true premises and, and uh, it's got to be valid. Mm -hmm. Uh, or inductively strong. Um, so what are the premises of this argument? What is the conclusion of this argument? Are the premises true? Does the conclusion follow? Um, ah, here's why I was having the intuition. I can now say what it is about the argument that's wrong with it. So, so you have an intuition, then you pin it down. If all you do is have the intuition, the intuition might be right, but you don't know it is. We do tend to go on gut feeling sometimes, and I, I think there are times when it's a good thing. If you're walking home late at night yes. and there's somebody behind you and your gut tells you there's something wrong, I think you should act on it. <laughs> um, I, you know, you don't always sit and think, now, could I be wrong about this? What's the... Um... So uh, there are times when I think going on intuition is... There's a, uh, some old question here, which isn't melodramatic or um, um, sensational. Um, but um, I want to buy some honey. You want to buy some holly? Some honey. Um, honey. honey. Oh, honey, yes. yes. So I can buy some local honey. I can buy fair trade honey from a certain country. I can buy New Zealand honey, which is organic. Now, I can understand how utilitarian is what helps me, but I need to have a lot of facts before we did so. Good. What I can't understand is how Kant and Hume now stop and help me in those circumstances. I think that's a very good question because you, you, you've given me a concrete decision that you need to make. And, OK, you're saying that you can see how utilitarianism helps you. Yeah, I need a lot of information. You, you would need a huge amount of information um, because it, what it does is it tells you you should act on whichever will produce the greatest happiness, the greatest number. OK, what do you think Aristotle would say? Well, the topic is the person to make the decision. I'm not quite sure how that would help. A virtuous person rather than a happy person. Yeah. He, he would say you should choose whichever honey the virtuous person would choose. Yeah. OK, well, you think that's not useful, but, but ask yourself, well, OK, what is a virtuous person? Organic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, the virtuous person is somebody who, who's who cares about other people. So, I mean, the fair trade perhaps comes in here. You know, he, he wants to be fair. He wants to be just. Um, he also wants to care for the environment. He, he wants to conserve the environment. So he might go for, you know. Um, he wants to be courageous. Um, maybe he should just go straight for the local one. I, I mean, I'm making it up here as I go along. But do you see what I mean? If, if you know what the virtues are and what it is to be virtuous. You'd still need to have a lot of information, but I don't really see that Aristotle's answer isn't as, as useful as the utilitarian answer, actually, when you, when you push it and find out about it. And then if you ask Hume, OK, he wants you to adopt a stable and general perspective on the buying of honey, so he wants you to consider the fact that if you buy fair trade honey, you're, you're buying at a, the price it actually costs rather than undercutting people who really can't afford to be undercut. If you buy local honey, you're supporting your local area, da-da-da-da. And he's waiting for you to see where your desires go on the basis of all this information until you reach a stable point. Again, you need to have a lot of information before you can make the decision. But I don't see he isn't giving you a way of making it. Do you see what I mean? And Kant's going to say, well, OK, you should um, perform whichever on whichever maxim is going to... Um, sorry, let, 
whichever maxim you're buying the honey on, you need to be able to universalise it. So do you think that everyone should buy fair trade honey? Do you think that everyone in your situation should buy the local honey? Do you think everyone should buy... And you're going to have reasons for why you think this. Again, do you see, it, it's a matter of thinking yourself into the mindset of each of these philosophers, and you'll see that each of them is requiring a lot of information about the world and about yourself and about other people uh, in order to make moral decisions. But we know that. This is why young children don't make moral decisions. They haven't got the experience. They, can't, they haven't got the understanding of, of the world and human nature in which to make these moral decisions. Does, does that help? Sorry, just let me ask, does that help you? It does, yes, but, but I, I could probably couldn't. With the utilitarian argument, I could probably mathematically work out which is better. Oh, really? Uh, how are you going to do somebody, that? Somebody, somebody. <laughs> how, how, tell me, how are you going to do that? <laughs> I, I, I could look at the, the carbon footprint and, uh, and, and the, uh, the I could, I could make equivalent in terms of economic um, advantages. It would be very, very difficult. But it would be even more difficult to, to use other perspectives because you could justify any answer by saying, yes, this is virtuous, this is the same view, and still come to free. Well, no, hang on. Um, I don't think you could justify any answer. I mean, it, there are some actions that are clearly not virtuous. I mean, shooting Mike, for example, is rather obviously an act that isn't. I mean, you can't just come up with anything. Uh, the, the, what these philosophers are asking you to do is not something you can learn to do right now. I mean, actually, Aristotle says that nobody can teach anyone else to be virtuous. In order to be virtuous, you've got to put in hard graft to find out what courage is and to know enough about yourself to know whether, um, in order to be courageous, you've got to move away from being rash or to move away from being cowardly. Because if you're a cowardly sort of person, then being brave is going to be rather different from if you're a rash sort of person. So you need to know yourself as much as you need to know the virtue, and you need to know what the situation demands of a courageous person. Um, but it, actually, if you think a lot about these things, if you ask yourself what courage is, what kindness is, what prudence is, etc., um, and you ask yourself sincerely, not, not as a sort of academic exercise, but in, in the sincere desire to know the answer you will be able to answer that question just as easily through Aristotle as you would through Mill I mean I, I think that the idea that utilitarianism provides us with a, a good decision procedure is actually it's just misleading it looks easier to us than the others do but that's because we've been brought up in a utilitarian world um, you know, utilitarianism is the moral theory of our generation, if you like. Yes, I wonder if in this case of the honey buying locally or fair trade, wouldn't there be many right answers for this? It's not only one is right and the other is wrong. Because um, there are many good reasons in both sides. I, it might be that, that there's more than one right answer. Yeah. Um, I think that doesn't mean there, isn't, there aren't wrong answers. Um, and also, of course, it might be that there's a right answer in this situation, but not in this situation. Uh, sorry, but the an that answer would not be right in this situation. Um, so the fact that there's more than one right answer doesn't mean there isn't. I mean, t take the dilemma with your mum again. I if we describe that just, you know, she says, what do you think, and you think, yuck. We can see that either being kind or being honest, both of them can be justified, can't they? Um, probably that's only because we've only got this very sketchy outline of what's happening, but both of them can be justified. But the fact that there are two right answers, two possible right answers, doesn't mean that there isn't a wrong answer. You know, you could kick your mum, and, and that would be, you know, that's something you shouldn't do in that situation, whatever it is that you should do. Um, you were first, and then. I suppose it's a, a somewhat similar question to the, to the one behind me. But um, I've spent uh, my professional career working within a code of professional ethics. So I suppose you could say I'm, I'm a deontologist because I've been working with rules, but they're, they're not absolute rules. 
uh, they have to be interpreted in different situations. Well, you might also be able to rule you to the table, of course. And sometimes you find that one, there are actually guiding principles more than rules. Mm -hmm. And you sometimes find that one is more than another. Or indeed, if you stick <coughs> rigidly to the guiding principles, you might find yourself in conflict, yeah. conflict with the law of the land. Mm -hmm. So again, I can see how utilitarianism can help with this situation. But I'm not so sure about some of the other. OK, things. well, your homework is to work out how the others will. Because actually, um, I mean, surely Aristotle would help you very well here. Because I mean, he's in the business of saying when rules conflict, you've got to engage in right reason. You've got to look directly to the virtues and ask yourself what virtue requires of you. And that's what you do do when you're faced with a, uh, one of these situations. And you might take a different tack. You might actually say, well, OK, um, what's going to produce the greatest happiness, the greatest number here? You could ask that, but I bet actually you, you engage in right reason more than you do um, utilitarian thinking. I just, it, it really is. I cannot tell you how to do these things. You can, only, you can work it out for yourself by reading Aristotle, reading Hume, reading Kant. And, and um, I mean, I would say waiting to be moved by them because you're rational animals. They're giving you rational arguments. When you start to see why what they say makes sense, then you're starting to understand them and you will start to apply their ideas. Um, I mean, I realise that's a, you know, you've probably got a job. You haven't got all the time. But it, it, it really is, if you do have time to, to actually get into these philosophers and think about what they're saying, they will move you because you are rational and they are using rational arguments. I mean, a lot, a lot of what you do in practice is... In, is in fact making sure that you can defend the decision that you made, mm -hmm. uh, if, if you ever should have to. Yes. Well, I, I, it's interesting to ask how, you, how you'd defend it, actually, because um, whether you'd be asked for a utilitarian defence or whether you could say, well, actually, I, I thought it was just... It would have been wrong for me to do this because it would have resulted in... Um, uh, it, uh, it would have been cowardly of me to do that, you might say. Um, if I'd done that, it would have been... I mean, actually, obeying the laws sometimes can be the coward's way out, can't it? Yeah. Um, and, and so here you, you decide to disobey a law because that's what courage demands of you. Probably something other than courage also demands it because it wouldn't be just... Thereby putting yourself at risk of mm. prosecution. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, I, th I think what the whole of this course has pushed me towards is the fact that there are, are no absolutes, and that everything depends on the situation in which you're making the decision. Well, that doesn't mean there aren't any absolutes, though, because there might be token absolutes. I mean, if, in fact, if everything depends on the situation, then you probably are an absolutist, but you're a token absolutist. Um, do you remember... Um, when I was talking about absolutism, I was looking at things like, um, let's say, produce the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Um, let's say that's our higher order absolute. Well, that means in a particular situation, whichever act it is that will produce the greatest happiness of the greatest number, that's the act you should do. Okay, so that action is right, becomes a moral absolute. But I, I would even argue that even at that level, there must be occasions when you... Even if you believed in the greatest happiness for the greatest number, there would be times when you would act against that and believe that to be right. But, yes, oh, completely, OK, but, but even so, if you think in that situation doing that action is right, then you can still be an absolutist because you're an absolutist about tokens, not about types. Go back to look at lecture one and look at token absolutism, or, or I, I, I might have called it situation absolutism, I'm not sure. Um, but, but you... I, I, I believe that your instinct that we need to look at the situation as a whole is right. I, I would be happy to call myself a situationalist. <laughs> uh, OK, but, but, uh, but I think you can't... 
I think it's very difficult to be a, a relativist and a situationalist. Uh, I, I think you said at one fairly early stage that um, Kent felt his views were sort of a priori truths, but they didn't, um, they didn't rebuke any disagreement at all. They, they, they popped somehow out of, the, out, out, of the, out of the woodwork without sort of... Um, I don't think you... Well, no, perhaps you didn't quite say that. <laughs> but um, they, they, they weren't deductive truths at all. They didn't come from... Uh, they, they didn't have an empirical basis. Yeah. They, they were just true in themselves. How does he feel they evolved, or that we could have any sort of, um, our, our epistemology could deal with that? Well, he thinks that moral statements are synthetic a priori truths, and there's a big problem with synthetic a priori. Synthetic means you must look to the world to determine truth. Uh, but a priori means you can know without experience. Um, so synthetic is usually opposed to analytic. So an analytic truth is a truth um, simply in virtue of the meanings of things. So all bachelors are married men. No, unmarried men uh, is an analytic truth. You only have to think of the meaning of the word bachelor and you can see that all bachelors are unmarried men is true. You don't have to look to the world at all. Okay? Uh, and a priori is uh, compared to a posteriori, uh, which means um, on the basis of experience. So you might think, well, how can there be synthetic truths that are a priori? Because you, a priori means we can just... Look at it, look at the concepts. For example, um, 2 plus 2 equals 4 is an a priori yeah. truth um, because you, you don't have to have experiences of 2s and 4s and things. You only need to know the meaning of 2 plus 2 and equals to see that 2 plus 2 equals 4. So this seems to be both analytic and a priori. And analytic and a priori go together and synthetic and a posteriori go together. Do you see how that works? So how can there be a synthetic a priori truth? And Kant thinks that that's what moral truths are. Well, OK, here's my go at doing this. I think um, in order to universalise the maxim on which you act, so, OK, to, to think about whether I should tell this... Should I make this false promise? in order to gain advantage for myself. Um, in order to answer that question, um, I've got to think about the world, because I've got to think about the, what promising is and what the consequences of promising, promise making is and so on, what the institution of promise keeping does. Um, but I don't need experience of everyone's making false promises in order to see that if they did, it would be bad. Are you with me? Do you, do you see how you can get something that looks like you do need experience of some kind, but you don't need experience of what it is you're thinking of? Um, that's how I make sense of it to myself. And so the a priori aspect is because um, you're looking at possible worlds, not at the actual world, to go back to the um, claim I was making earlier. Does that help? Yeah, no, it picks it where it fits in. I can see that now. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't make me more sympathetic towards it, but... Uh... What, the idea that there is synthetic a priori? Yeah, yeah, well, I couldn't know, but I can, I can see that that's how yeah. I do it. OK. Is, isn't it the case that Kent is trying to identify a necessary world to say, well, you need moral rules to make society work? And that if people didn't tell them... No, he doesn't think that the... Um, no, that would be very consequentialist. You've got an aim in mind, making society work, and what you've got to do is, is act in this way. Um, and that's not what he's trying to do. He's not a consequentialist of any kind. Um, but he does think that the moral law is a necessary law. Um, he, d he does think that when you see that an action is right it's necessarily right, but that's not what you meant. I think. 
maybe I've misunderstood him. I thought he was saying it's right because it's got to be this way. Yes, that he is saying. But you're saying in, in relation to the logic, not in relation to the Yes, exactly. Not in relation to the production of a particular end, um, but rather in relation to the logic. Yeah. Yeah, I just kind of ask for people. Am I, am I right in thinking that Aristotle and Hume don't really take into consideration the social dimension of life? Because um, many of the standards uh, we, we adopt do spring from our sort of reference groups, the ones that we belong to. For instance, with honey, if we happen to be organic people, we might well choose <coughs> organic honey. If we were sort of, um, I don't know, we like Greek. Um, Greece, um, well, no, because the important thing is whether you're right to, to, to be organic people. No, I, I don't think that either Hume or Aristotle leave out the social dimension, particularly not Aristotle, who, who thinks that human beings are political animals par excellence. Yeah, so um, he, he was suggesting, though, maybe I've got that wrong then, because if you didn't know uh, the answer when you're standing there and, and this poor lady with her pearl hair, you know, whatever it is, uh, you should bring a friend. Well, that's <laughs> or, or should, should, should they be many friends? Um, yes, that's a difficult one. I think in, in that particular case, you probably have to make your own mind up whether you're... So it's going to be wrong from a liberal paradigm. I mean, what you would probably do if you were caught in that situation is next time you were with your friend in the pub, you'd say, then this happens. What do you think I should have done? No, the, reality, the reality is, you, in the pub, you probably talk to several people. My point is that it's a social thing. Um, but Aristotle is saying, you no, no, no. ask other people. No, no, no. Um, I mean, you don't necessarily need to ask before the action. I mean, probably in the case of your mum, you might not be able to ask before the action, but you could certainly ask after the action and, and put into your computation for next time what the answers were from the people you got. And we do do that, don't we, all, all the time. OK, we're going to stop there because I'm exhausted. <laughs> I can't do any more. OK, well, thank you very much, everyone. It's um, been great fun teaching you.